Hi everyone, my name is Angie. I'm the program coordinator for the Business Center Guelph Wellington. And today we are joined with David Hobson from the University of Guelph to talk about IP 101. So David, thank you so much for coming uh, and welcome to the live streams and bridges. And I'll let this, I'll let you take over from here. Okay, sounds good. So uh, I'm David Hobson and I'm from the University of Guelph. And I'm just going to share my screen and get set up here. So let's just do that. And I've got a PowerPoint. So let's just try and get that going. Can you guys see a PowerPoint there? I hope so. Got a good nod. Uh, let's put it on presentation mode. Okay. And uh, now that you've seen my lovely face, I don't think you need to see my talking head. We'll just work our way through the slides. So I'm actually going to turn off my camera and I'm just going to do that. Okay. Everybody good? Hearing no complaints, then we're, we're off and running. Okay. So um, I've been asked today to give kind of a real basic background on intellectual property uh, as it relates to business, as it relates to research. Now, obviously, I come from the research space and academia. Um, and so, you know, we're all about research and discovery and creating new things. But intellectual property is very important for all businesses at any stage of development, whether you're just a startup or whether you're an established business. OK, um, you know, if you go to the, you know, the, uh, um, you know, to SIPO, the, um, you know, at, uh, you know, for the federal government, you'll notice that they really push businesses to start developing their own intellectual property as a competitive asset. All right. So let's get started. Thank you, Angela. That's not. Oh, sorry. Something happened, Dave, and I you got muted. Can you unmute yourself? Is that there better we... again? Yeah, you're good. I don't know why that happened, but. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right, let's just go back one. All right, little technical note, um, probably best to mute your microphone. And uh, if you're having trouble with bandwidth and it's glitching on you, then just turn your video, turn your video off, your camera off, and then you can still see the slides. And if you wanna ask a question, just throw it in the chat box um, or raise your hand and then we'll get to you and try to give everybody a turn to ask questions, okay? And if you want to copy the slides, we can send those to you. Or I actually, I think it's even being recorded for YouTube so you can watch the presentation there. All right. This is me at the university. Um, all this really says is that I've done a whole bunch of things and I've never stuck to any one thing. OK, so I'm a master of none, jack of all trades. And uh, I've had maybe too much education in too many different areas. But that actually works well when you're trying to look for new ideas and new innovations and moving them forward. A lot of what I do is I look at research, patent it, and then license and sell those patents to industry so that that research then turns into something that makes a difference in the world, okay? Um, and I've worked with hundreds of faculty to do this. So, so that's kind of my role. You can read this at your leisure another time. So at the Research Innovation Office at the University of Guelph, we do four main things. Uh, number one, we... Um, work with industry to help them solve problems. We call this industry liaison, industry liaison. And in short, we, uh, they have a problem and they have money and they pay us to work with them to do complex problem solving and collaborative research. The other thing we do is we work with our own researchers to make sure that their research results are put into a usable form and that that knowledge gets out of the university so the rest of the world, including the general public and the Canadian public, can use it to do what they want to do. So that's creating impact uh, you know, from our research. The two areas that I work in are technology transfer and new venture creation. In technology transfer, as I said, it mainly involves looking at the research results after a project is finished. We patent those results, occasionally copyright and trade secret but mainly it's about patenting those results like a new COVID vaccine. And then we license them to a company like a pharmaceutical company, which would then actually bring it to the world. And that would actually be a commercial product with positive impact. 
The other thing I do is I coach graduate students and faculty members on how to create startup companies based in their research expertise. Okay. All right. So why should you care about intellectual property? Well, the main thing is, is because it's that creativity that changes the world. All right. And so by, you know, coming up with new ideas, by being an inventor, uh, whether it's a new business, whether it's a new product, whether it's research that turns into a new vaccine, uh, those are the new products that get used in the world that actually changes the world, makes the world a better place, um, you know, makes people healthier, happier, hopefully wealthier so that they're not in poverty. And so universities play a big role in this because we're just, you know, a discovery arm, you know, we go out and create new knowledge and, and you can see here there's many examples of different things that universities have created that really have changed the world. Um, something close to home, the University of Toronto, you know, they created insulin, you know, Banting and Best, um, as well as the, you know, the electron microscope, which is not something most of us use, but it really did, um, you know, advance science and technology. So the latest big thing that everybody's been talking about is CRISPR. And this is a new invention where you, you know, you can genetically at, edit many, many different types of, of organisms um, using this type of technology. And so that's a really fascinating thing. So let's get to the basics. What is intellectual property? Well, it's anything that comes out of a human mind. So essentially, these are original creative thoughts that come out of the human mind that are useful for doing something. And a perfect example of this in the commercial space would be new drugs, new drugs and new vaccines. That is intellectual property. Somebody thought about ways to put things together as a drug um, that would solve a problem and make people healthier and happier, in this case, dealing with the pandemic. Um, it could be new materials, new types of steel or carbon fiber, you know, Velcro, you know, uh, you know, different tools and machines and methods, ways of making things. All of that is intellectual property. Okay. It also can be in an artistic form. And so, and in this way, you know, think largely about, you know, music and books. So, you know, the, you know, the Harry Potter, Potter series, you know, the, you know, different songs and stuff that come out. Those are all forms of intellectual property. Those are those lyrics and those music notes that all came out of the human mind. Uh, but even something as simple as a painting, you know, when you paint a picture of something, you know, that actually is your impression out of your mind in terms of what you wanted to put down. And that's intellectual property. So every country has laws on intellectual property. And so it's legally defined. It's, it's, you know, except for cases where it's a physical painting, it's, it's not really a tangible asset. You know, these are intellectual property is an intangible asset. You know, these are ideas that are then protected and then they actually call them intellectual property rights. And every country has their own set of intellectual property laws. And to a large extent, at least in the Western world, most of these countries are aligned. So they treat intellectual property the same way. They use the same definitions. They protect it in the same way. And as you can see along the bottom here, you know, we have patents, we have copyright, the C, we have plant beaters rights, we have trade secrets. Um, and then there's a few others and I'll go into those as well. So here's the big picture on intellectual property. These are the, these are the main types. The bolded area are the areas to a large extent that the universities play in, okay? But I'll just kind of run through these. Patents, you know, if you haven't used patents before, and a lot of people haven't unless they're, you know, in, in the technology creation business, is that they're all about protecting the novel function of something. So it does something that's, you know, new and innovative, and it protects that so that other things can't do the same thing. Do, you know, can't copy that function. Utility models is, is, is kind of like a patent, but it's mainly used in China. And it essentially, it also protects the novel function, except it's much easier to get. So it's a much lower standard. So it, it, it's a way of kind of offering some partial protection. We don't use them here in Canada or the United States. Then there's industrial designs. And these are, the, you know, some people call these design patents. In Canada, we call them industrial designs, and it protects how something looks. 
It has nothing to do with what it does or its function. And so, you know, a perfect example of this is like Apple, the way their computers look with the Apple on the back and those rounded edges and the shiny aluminum appearance, um, that is all about its aesthetic appearance and that is protected. It has, you know, it could be an empty box, but that, com that computer box is protected with an industrial design or a design pattern. Next, there's copyright. And, and copyright is anything that you as a person, not a computer, that you as a person author. If you are the author on something, whether it's a novel, a story, an essay in school, um, you know, copy that you, that you put into your advertisement, you know, these are all your personal creative expressions that you came up with and you can protect those as well. All right. So you're, so, you know, music and novels, obviously the big, the big thing that are involved copyright there. You're not, you're not protecting the ideas. You're protect, you're protecting your expression of what you're trying to say. All right. Then the next thing that a lot of businesses, and this is probably what most of the, you know, people watching today uh, will want to do is to trademark specific things, logos, words, names that are associated with your business. And trademarks protect your reputation. And they, they, you know, they try and instill loyalty. And, you know, it's a lot of people call it branding. Well, branding comes from actually animals where you burned a, a letter or a symbol in the side of the animal so that you know who its owner was or you know the source of the product. Well, that's what trademarks do. Trademarks protect the authenticity of the source of your product. The Nike whoosh is a very common example, all right? So trademarks are, are really important for businesses that have been in business for a long time and have a very big reputation to protect. So plant breeders rights, universities play in this space because they actually do research to create new crops. And so those new crops, not genetically modified crops, but normal, natural new crops, they can be protected with plant breeders rights. You can kind of think of it like a patent for plants, but it's different. It's very specific to plants and breeding these plants. Next would be integrated circuit designs. And so this is really, think of this as like a map for a microchip. And you know that 3D structure of layers and circuits that are all done in microscopic detail, uh, that can actually be protected so people can't copy it exactly. The next uh, area are trade secrets. And trade secrets are the most common type of intellectual property because um, a lot of businesses can't afford to file patents or to use other methods. So they just keep information that's important for them to run a good business as a secret. And that's called a trade secret. So if you can keep it a secret and it's useful and it's commercially useful, then that's a trade secret. And then the last, the last form of intellectual property is anything that you can potentially put into a legal contract. And so you, you, know, you can have two parties and you use a legal agreement and you say, okay, this is what we're gonna do and this is how we're gonna control it. And a lot of the times that's how you would control something like a physical material that's rare that you don't want other people to get and you want to be able to use it in a very specific way. So with a legal contract, I will share my material, my proprietary material, with another company or an individual, providing they only use it in a very specific way for that reason, including maybe not reverse engineering it, not trying to figure out how to use it. You can also do this with data or materials or other information through confidentiality agreements. So confidentiality and, and specific use agreements um, would often be used for proprietary information or proprietary materials. All right. So if you're gonna create some intellectual property and almost everybody does who runs a business, um, who owns that IP? Well, according to common law and our intellectual problem, uh, property laws in Canada, the inventors own any of the IP that they create unless they have agreed to assign it to some other party, all right? Now, this doesn't mean that you have the exclusive right to commercialize it because even though you created it, somebody might've already created it before you. And you didn't even know that. And so they may have already secured some, in, some legal intellectual property rights first. 
And so you as the creator now are just late to the party, so to speak. So you own it if you create it, unless another party invented it before you or registered it before you, as well as if you're working for someone else, as most of us are employees, it's very common for that employer to say, a condition of you being an employee in my company is that everything you do, all of the work you do shall be owned by me, the employer. And, and oftentimes they'll even ask you to sign a, a document to say you assign all of your inventions that you create in your job to the employer. So you then have assigned your current and your future intellectual property rights that happen in the performance of your job. And this is quite common. This is, uh, you know, most commercially focused companies would do this. Um, the university actually is maybe an exception to that. So the other thing is that you have to make sure that, you know, if you're going to create something that you haven't executed any other type of agreement that is giving away the IP that you create. And a lot of the times this might be in a fee for service agreement. So oftentimes, if you are a consultant for another party and they're paying you to do some consulting, the people who are paying you want to own all of your results. And in, in they essentially want to own the intellectual property so they can use it for their business. So if you don't want that to happen, you need to negotiate that before you sign such an agreement. Or you might be a subcontractor where you do website design and now you need help. So you bring some other people in who are another company and you subcontract out some of those to get that work done. Well, you need to make sure who's gonna own that website when you're done. Is it going to be the end customer? Is it gonna be the person who was you know, doing the work and hiring you to be the subcontractor or does the subcontractor own? All right. So, you know, these are things where you have to be careful because quite often when people purchase things, they want to purchase all of the rights to use it, which means they want to control the intellectual property that is within the product that they purchase. And then lastly, and this is common to academics, is that it might be a condition of the, you know, of the grant um, or the funding agreement, whether it's to create and, uh, you know, to support a business or whether it's to do research where the people who are giving you money say, yeah, we're gonna give you $100,000 to help with this project, but we want to jointly own any of the intellectual property that's created out of that project. Um, or just like an investor investing in a startup company, they may say, I'll give you money to do something, but I want a piece of the pie, a percentage or all of the intellectual property that you create, all right? So always be careful. So you own it unless you sign an agreement otherwise. So who owns it at the U of G? Well, the U of G is, is actually you know, similar. Um, all of the student staff and faculty members own the IP they create. Um, and if they want to, they can give it to the university if they want the university to then invest in it and try and develop it for commercial purposes, but they don't have to, so that's voluntary. But, and if they don't want to do that, they can then personally own it and they can create their own startup company, they can create their own um, business opportunity, but then they have to do that on their own time, um, you know, using their own resources, so not the university's resources. But if they do wanna work with the university, then the university will invest its money and will share any profits that come out of this 50-50. So that way the inventors who have created something don't have to put a big financial um, payment uh, in play to support and pr protect the intellectual property, they can then just focus on the science and helping to develop it into a new use. And the university will focus on the commercialization and paying the bills along the way. So the exceptions at the university here are obviously, if it's your job to actually create something, if you're a computer programmer and your job is to create code for the university, then the university owns that code. And so job um, uh, job fact sheets are specifically written that, you know, these are things that you shall do in your job and the outputs of this, these specific tasks are owned by the university because that's, that, that's why you're, that's the focus of what you're doing and how it helps the university operate. The other thing is, is that we get grants from governments, we get them from industry partners, 
Um, and, you know, sometimes they stipulate what we can and can't do with the IP and who will own it or jointly own it um, with that IP. And that makes sense because an, a company who wants to do research together doesn't want the intellectual property to go to their competition, but at the same time, the people who create it, they deserve to be rewarded as well. So, so as we, as we start creating intellectual property, we create, you know, original useful things people want to then know who can they talk to about this and who gets control and ownership and who gets the future benefits usually off it's about you know it's about using it in business to make a profit and so just to give you an idea these are all the different types of relationships that universities have with businesses and you as small businesses may work with the university in one of these type of projects at some point in time so you know on the far left side, we have philanthropy where, you know, people are generous and they give money to the university, no strings attached. The academics then can use that for research on anything they want. On the other end, on the far right, we have um, companies who they want to do, you know, they want to access uh, academics because they're subject matter experts and they can do faculty consulting. And that can be entirely confidential, private, personal with the faculty member, no university resources are used and the industry partner is completely in control and they own everything. And then there's everything in the middle, all right? Where it's a combination of sharing both the benefits, um, you know, and the, and the risks of working together with somebody. And most commonly, uh, small companies might come to the university to do industry sponsored research where then you might pay some money to the university you might, you know, get some money from the government. So it's a government grant and together the academic researcher will then work on a project that's focused on what the industry partner needs and will try and solve that problem. It may or may not create useful intellectual property, but if it does, it usually means that there's going to be some direct control by the industry partner in some form and a little bit of control by the academics who do the work. So now let's get into the nitty gritty. This is essentially the most important slide in the whole presentation because it gives you um, kind of a quick look at the three most important forms of intellectual property that most businesses play with, okay? And I just say most, um, and that, those are patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And patents are the ones that get the most attention, but they're actually, you know, to a certain extent, you know, the riskiest tool to use for a number of reasons. But I'm just gonna go through these one at a time to give you a flavor for, you know, what they are and what they do and, and what are the rules of the game, so to speak. So, so patents are, are a tool to block the competition for 20 years. And, and remember, they protect function, how something works. So this could be compositions of matter. So that's just a fancy way of saying new drugs. Um, it could be a device, like a medical device, could be like a bicycle, could be a car, could be a, you know, alternator in a car, could be any type of machinery. It could be methods of how to make stuff, you know, how to make, you know, uh, Gore-Tex or, you know, graphene or diagnostic tests or even how to make different, you know, foods and, and, and materials for, you know, for in the ag industry. These, you know, anything that, you know, has a new use and anything that has a new function could potentially be patented. The downfall with a patent, though, is that they get published. So as you try to obtain a patent, you actually expose and, and, and let the, you know, the, the world know about how your new invention works. So if you don't get a patent, you just told everybody how to copy it and you didn't end up getting your patent approved. So then you gave everybody, you know, you basically helped them catch up to where you were at. So that's kind of the downfall, but that's the social contract that patents have. If you tell us how it works, we can learn from that and we'll give you a 20 year monopoly to stop others from using your invention. So patents and trademarks and copyrights, they're all negative rights, which means they prevent others from copying and using what you have protected. And it's your job to go and stop them from doing that by taking them to court or you know, threatening to take them to court 
um, so that they stop doing that. The government won't do it for you. There aren't other companies. The police won't knock on anybody's door and say, hey, you're infringing on a patent. It's your job to police your own patent. So after 20 years, your patent is um, invalid and it's terminated. And your invention is now free to, free to use for anybody in the public domain. So you get 20 years to dominate your invention and basically to recoup all of the investment that you've made in creating this invention and hopefully make more. And then in the meantime, you're trying to create version two and maybe perhaps file another patent. Patents are also the most expensive tool you can use when it comes to protecting function. Um, it can be very expensive, like $20,000 to $500,000 per country. And if you wanted to patent in you know, the G20, that's a lot of countries, it gets very expensive. So it, it, it works well if you're gonna sell a lot of products in a lot of countries, but it can get very expensive very quickly. And it takes a long time to get a patent approved. So you know, it, you know, it, it can take two to five years at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, CEPO. And you know, you know, that, that might be too slow for you to have protection because you want, might wanna start selling products in the first year. And yet you don't even know if your patent is approved yet. So it, you know, it, it's a bit ambiguous, it's not certain. So it's a slow process. And essentially, as I said, the goal of a patent is to slow the competition down. You're not gonna stop the competition because they're gonna try and find a way to go around your patent and you know, come up with ideas that are not infringing on your patent, but still come up with a product that is maybe almost as good or even better than whatever product you're coming up with. So um, you know, it's a way of slowing the competition down. Next is trademarks. And this is, this is what all small businesses should be doing if your business is going well and growing and you're planning on maintaining your business uh, you know, for a prolonged period of time because trademarks are all about loyalty. And it, you know, you know, it could be the name of your business, just like a Starbucks um, you know, or Joe's Pizza Place, um, you know, Pierre Poutine. Those all can be trademarked as being very specific to your business. And you can trademark things two ways. You can just take a name and put TM in the top right corner of that name or logo, and you don't even have to register it. What you're doing is you're telling the world that I'm declaring this as my trademark. It's not a registered trademark, but it, you're, you're at least putting people on notice. The other thing you can do is use the circle R, which is a registration, which means you would go to the Canadian Intellectual Property Office and register it, and they would then look to make sure you're not confusing anybody, you're not too similar to anybody else's trademark, and then if they approve it, you then have a registered trademark, which is much more, much easier to protect in court. Um, but you don't have to do that, especially for small businesses. So trademarks are something that everybody should be using. The name of your business, the name of your products, any special logos that you made yourself that are not copies of other people's logos um, that you want to associate with your business so that when people see that logo, they go, oh yeah, that's Dave's business. And I really like the stuff they make or the stuff they sell or the taste of their food, whatever it is, it's a way to associate the, you know, the good features of your business and products with a specific logo. McDonald's is a perfect example. The golden arches, you know, the big yellow M. People see the yellow M and they know, yep, I know what I'm going to get from McDonald's. It's the same every time, whether you like it or not. Um, you know, you, you have that um, trust in the source of that product because it has the M. It's not going to be some other business because they're the only ones allowed to use the big yellow M. So with trademarks, you can keep renewing them. You get a 10-year term. They're, 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 they can cost you a little bit of money, obviously, by country, anywhere from $2,000 to $50,000 per country. And it depends on how complex and how many that you register. Um, you know, as I said, essentially with some of them, you could do them for free just by using the TM as the top right corner of whatever your mark is, and they can be approved relatively quickly in six to 12 months. And again, the focus here is to maximize loyalty of your existing customers and to attract new customers because they trust the mark. So next would be copyright. 
And copyright is really for those, you know, more creative artistic people, although it can also apply to things like architectural plans and, and other forms of expression. Um, but a lot of it is, you know, images. So if you're doing website design and stuff like that, uh, literature, if you're writing novels, and of course, obviously music. You can also even use copyright to protect software, but but software really is not meant to be protected by any of these tools, even though you can use them for some. Probably the best way to protect uh, software is by encrypting it. So people just can't figure out all of the code that's underneath. If they work hard enough, they'll probably be able, be able to write their own code, but that encryption is probably the, the, the correct way to protect software, if it even needs to be protected, all right? So with copyright, it lasts for the life of the author plus 50 years. And that's in Canada and the States, they have 70 years and that's because of a case with Walt Disney. Um, it, it can be generally, it can be free as long as you have a record and proof of your creation and that you are the author, or you can actually register it with SIPO. And, and, you, and so you can, you, there are ways to register your copyright, but most people don't, they just put people on, they publish something, there's a, public record and they put copyright the year and their name uh, as the author okay it can be very fast as soon as you publish it you can then you know back up your claim that you know you are the author and uh, it's all about protecting your creative expression so these are the most common tools used by by you know small and medium-sized businesses uh, in protecting their intellectual property but there is one more, which is not, uh, is not um, coded in our laws in Canada, but that's trade secrets. And so the most common form of protection is to just keep your secret ideas that you don't need to share with other people, but help you run your business, to just keep them a secret among you and your employees. And that's the way you make your metal parts. It's the way you make your websites. It's the way you make your... Um, you know, if it's a special recipe and you keep it as a trade secret. And we'll get into that a little bit later. And there's a bunch of other ways you can protect things as well below there, but we don't have time to go into them. So getting back to patents, because that's the one that people tend to either love or hate. And they also tend to think that it's a get rich quick scheme, which it is not. Um, uh, this is what you need to do if you want to get an approved patent. So you invent something, first it has to be novel. In other words, you have to be the first person to have created that invention. And there's no public literature, no website, no documents anywhere that describe something that is the same or extremely similar to what you've invented. So first in the world essentially is, is what you have to be to, to uh, get a patent. So it has to be novel. It has to be useful. Now, most things that you invent for a purpose are useful. So that's easy. That, that's not a problem. And then it has to be non-obvious. And this means that, that someone skilled in the art, so if we were dealing with carpentry, it would be an average carpenter, must not find that the invention could be an obvious extension of the prior art, meaning, oh yeah, with the common tools of a carpenter, I could create that uh, new hanging door, all right? Um, or any combination of other inventions that are, that are obvious by putting them together in a logical way, all right? So you have to basically take a bit of a leap by having an inventive step that isn't just a logical, obvious, slight improvement of the what is already known in the public domain. And this is always an argument with the patent office, but it is something that um, you know you have to be very careful because if someone else has done something similar, they invented a door for a car and you're just applying that door to a house, then that might be just an obvious extension of someone who makes doors. And therefore that invention would be obvious to somebody skilled in the art. I know that's kind of a simple example, but that same app, that, that same principle applies to genetics and genetic engineering. You know, if you can genetic engineer a bacteria in such a way, then you might be able to just apply exactly the same principle, you know, to viruses or fungi. And so, you know, just applying it to something else 
won't necessarily pass that bar of being not obvious. Okay, it's an obvious adaptation of what people already know. The next thing is it has to be patentable subject matter, which essentially means you cannot patent mother nature. So anything that's man-made is allowable subject matter, but um, if mother nature made it and you didn't invent it, then you cannot patent that material, but you may be able to patent a new use for that material. So it depends, but in general, it's anything man-made. And next, in order to get this patent, in your patent application, you have to write in enough detail so that somebody reading that patent can copy, make, and use your invention. So you have, you're actually giving away the secret of your invention in order to apply to get a patent. And this then you know, will allow others to learn and develop, but not use your patent if it gets approved. And then the last thing you need to do is you have to be the first one who shows up at the patent office with that, such an application. And, you know, in the academic world, it happens a lot where two people might be rushing to get to the patent office. One might have invented it first, but the, but the other party got to the patent office first. So they're the ones that will get the patent because they're the ones to first submit the application to obtain a patent. And that's called first to file. All right, so because patents, everybody think it's a get rich quick scheme, which, which it is not. In the United States, about 97% of all patents filed don't even make enough money for, to pay for the patent prosecution process. So in other words, they lose money. Only 3% of those patents are actually money makers. So that's not very good odds. Now, the ones that are used properly, they do very well. It also says that there's a lot of patents that are filed and people just aren't doing their homework. They just probably shouldn't have filed it in the first place. So if you're gonna file a patent, you probably should be expecting, and let's just say in the US, cause that's where we have the most data, you're gonna spend about $30,000 because just to file the patent and get it into play is gonna cost you around $10,000 over on the far left, you can see there on your cumulative costs. And that's gonna take you about six months to a year. And then you're going to probably take that to the patent office and they'll start looking at it. The patent office will usually, they don't like the way it's written and they say, no, I don't believe you. I don't think this is inventive enough. Prove to me this is more inventive or that it's not obvious or whatever other objection they have. And it's kind of like a, a legal argument back and forth. Sometimes the lawyers are involved, sometimes not. And you end up spending a lot of money in several years to eventually convince the patent office that yes, this is novel, useful, non-obvious, um, and that you know you should grant my patent, and they do. Four or five years later, you've already spent twenty thousand dollars. And then once your patent's granted, you have to pay like a license fee, like on your car, to keep it alive, to keep it active. And so then you pay these fees over time. In the end, you spend about thirty thousand dollars. All right. And that's, that's minimum in the United States. Other countries like Japan can be significantly more. Um, a few other countries can be significantly less, but in general, it's an expensive process. And if you're filing two or three patents in that country because you're patenting different things, but all related to your company, the money adds up very quickly. So it's an expensive process. So you have to be prepared for that um, from day one. So as I said, 97% of patents don't, don't make enough money to pay for themselves. Well, this is because people haven't actually adequately searched that their patent is trying, their patent application is trying to protect something that somebody else has maybe already patented or is very similar to what somebody has already patented. And so they didn't actually go and adequately do a prior art search. So you, you need to go and find out who's your competition, what has already been invented and, and, you know, that will then determine, should I even spend a dime on filing a patent application? Because, you know, the odds of getting something approved, you know, might be 10,000 to one. And so here are four good websites uh, that you can easily access. Obviously, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office over on the right-hand side, SIPO. Um, Google, you can always use Google, and they have Google Patents, which is specific to that. And um, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, probably one of the most common databases searched just because the United States is probably the most lucrative market currently. 
um, for selling products of any type. And therefore, if you have a patent, you'll sell more of them. So, and then there's a free site called The Lens, which I actually like because it can actually get into some of the nitty gritty of patents and it allows you to play with the data a little bit, okay? So if you're thinking of protecting something with a patent, before you do anything, you need to spend many hours searching the databases to make sure that you really are first. Um, and the other thing is these databases will help you understand who your competition is if you do decide to go forward, because they'll probably have stuff in here that's at least in the same space. So you may learn a little bit. So it could be some of your competitive intelligence. So you file your patent, now you have to protect it. And as I told you, the owner of the patent has to protect their patent. So you have to go and find out who might be, you know, copying your invention without telling anybody. And you have to then try and take them to court and spend money to stop them. So what kind of success rate do you have if you catch them? Well, the success rate in court, and these are US numbers, a bit old, 2018, you only win 25 to 37% of the time. And so, you know, and, and, and that also depends on whether or not you are a company that makes products or you just happen to be what's called a non-practicing entity that owns the patent, but you license it to other people. So that an example of that would be a university. We might own the patent, but we license it to GM to make auto parts. And so if the university sues somebody for copying our patent, you know, we may only have a 25% chance of defending our patent. So not great odds. So you really need to be careful. Um, this is not an easy process. It's expensive to police it and stop other people. When you win, it can be rewarding, but you don't always win. So you can see here, you know, um, you know, 50% of people when they win, you know, it can be $10 million. So that's a, that, that's a good win, but it takes you several years to get to trial. It also, once the trial starts, you're, you're arguing with lawyers and stuff for a year. All of that costs a lot of money. So if you do wanna win, you, know, you might spend a couple million dollars to defend yourself to potentially win as $10 million. Uh, just out of interest, you know, if there's a jury deciding on whether you, can, you, you, know, you deserve a, um, um, damages for, for somebody copying your invention, the jury will give you about five times more money than a judge would. So just, just an interesting fact. Um, even if you win, it's going to be appealed. 78% of patent cases get appealed. And then uh, once they appeal it, half of those, then they change what the damage is or what the award was. So you won $10 million, they appealed it. And then they say, oh, we, maybe we're a bit too hard. We're going to decrease the award down to $2 million. But you might have spent $2 million to get to court. So you might, you know, you might only break even. So, I mean, it, it, it varies and it depends on whether or not they're paid, you know, some of your patent costs and, and, and legal fees as well. So just to give you a flavor, what are the most common patent lawsuits that, that industry uh, takes to court? Well, obviously the Apple and Samsung type things. So consumer products, iPhones, Samsung, cell phones. And then the other thing, if you think about it, it's biotech. And in that case, you can think about drugs, um, you know, and so this can be, I mean, there was a patent case involving CRISPR. So in the invention of those patents. So, okay, so the patent pathway is a hard path to follow, but it can be very useful if you do it properly and you have a very lucrative product um, that is very innovative. So you've invented something, but you don't know if it's a standalone invention or not. And most inventions are actually really novel, innovative improvements to somebody else's previous invention. So somebody you know, created a tire and you created a tire with a new type of rubber, okay? You know, think about the Blizzak tires, you know, in terms of you know, the, the, the tire has a special compound composition of matter that sticks to ice better. And essentially, that's how those tires work. So, you know, is it patentable? Well, it can be patentable if it truly is novel. And we call these improvements. And so you have something that's maybe patented or not. Maybe it's even expired or never had a patent. 
and you make it a little better, but using the criteria, novel, non-obvious, and useful. And that improvement now can be a new patent. So people can make the old tires, but they can't make the new tires. So most patents actually are technically improvements on past inventions and patents. Now, the problem here is that sometimes you don't have the freedom to operate. You don't have the freedom to sell the new rubber for your tire because it might be based on a past invention that is also still patented. The patent hasn't expired. And so to use the new rubber in a tire, you need to use the patent for a tire plus your new composition of rubber. And so then you sometimes have to go back and ask for a license for the previous patent. Okay, so that's called a freedom to operate. So you have to be careful if you are creating improvements to something in a very fast, um, you know, developing market, then that freedom to operate can be an issue because the previous inventions, those patents may last for, you know, 15 to 20 years because you've created a better version of it, but you created it very quickly after the, the original patent was filed. So be careful there. Next, should I bother filing a patent or should I just keep my invention a trade secret? So the, the, the very first question you have to ask yourself is, can I keep a secret? If I'm doing this in my company and my employees are doing the work and I'm trading with other, uh, uh, you know, other companies and selling products, depending where I am in the value chain, do I have the ability to keep it secret? Th this is key. And so if it's, if it's like a black box, often like, you know, something like a, um, well, just think of it in terms of a black box and they can't take it apart to figure out how it works and copy it. Well, then a trade secret might be a good idea. If you're a small company, with not very much money, but you have a good product, then, and you, and you know you're gonna be challenging a giant company like a Google, then maybe you just keep it a trade secret. And really what's gonna happen is the giant company's probably gonna buy you. Um, maybe you can keep it a trade secret long enough so that you're the only provider, but um, if you put it in a patent, they're just going to copy your patent and they're going to try and go around you, or they might just copy your patent and say, take us to court. You don't have enough money to take us to court. If, you're, if the people that are copying your invention are end users, and here think of students downloading music illegally, then that's not uh, easy to take all of those individuals to court to stop them from stealing or copying, infringing your invention. All right. So when they're the end users, it's not a single company. It's a whole bunch of individual people. If it's in a market where the life cycle of the products that you produce is only a few years, for example, in the software business, where, you know, you're, you're you know, I mean, certainly if you're using Microsoft, your software is updated every month almost. Um, then patenting it may not make sense. It may make a lot more sense just to encrypt it, keep it a trade secret, next version of software, and away you go. Uh, because the, the software is going to be obsolete even before the patent ever gets approved. If the technology is one of many possible solutions, as in like a recipe for a food, and there's lots of different recipes for a certain type of food, you know, you have a great recipe for butter chicken, um, you might be best just to keep it a trade secret instead of you know, telling other people exactly what the recipe is and then they copy it and then you have to go out and chase them. If you have enough money to chase them, that's fine. But again, they might just change one or two ingredients in the recipe and now they're not technically copying you. So that, again, a trade secret might be the way to go. And then the last thing is, is if you want more than 20 years of protection, well then trade secret is the only way you're gonna be able to do it. It's the only you know, legal means that you can do it. So the, co the recipe for Coca-Cola, that's a trade secret. Technically, it's been, a, it's been a recipe that's been a secret for over 100 years. Now, the recipe's also changed over time and changed by geography, but there's an example, okay? So lastly, for your businesses, as I said before, um, you should consider using trademarks. You should be trademarking your company name, you know, Hobson Consulting, TM, 
um, you know, or a brand name, you know, you might have different products and different brands that you manage within your company, a certain style of pizza, uh, you know, the Hawaiian super duper pizza, you know, um, any kind of logo you use, providing you created it and it is original, um, you should also trademark those. You don't want people to copy what you're doing because if you start, if your business is successful, people will want to learn from you and try and represent that they're as good as or better than you. And they might actually use or borrow or infringe on your trademarks to do so because that will help them be more successful. So you have to protect your, your space. The other thing is your domain names, your web names, your, you know, whatever UL is, you know, you might want to align that directly with your company name, or you might want to be align it with your brand or none of them. And it depends how in love and, and, and secure you are with keeping your company name, because once you register your domain name, um, you know, you may not be able to get another domain name that is useful to you. And so you have to kind of live with that. So make sure you're happy with that. Okay. I'm going to skip this slide because it's mainly about if you're going to work with academics, you're an industry partner, you're a company, and you want to hire an academic to work with you. Usually you're going to work in the industry sponsored research collaboration space where you're going to pay us a little bit of money. The government might top it up and we're going to work together to solve a problem. And the main thing here is talk about what you want to get out of that project. And I think we have one of my colleagues, um, Gregor Lawson is going to come and talk about this in the future. And a lot of it is about, okay, when the results come out of this problem solving, how can we, the business, the industry partner, how can we use those results without letting our competitors get, you know, get to use them because they obviously didn't participate and, and uh, fund this project. Okay. And any project that you get involved in, you should at least be aware that you might be creating intellectual property and there's a lot of things to balance, okay? We talked a little bit about freedom to operate, but you know, each party often has some background intellectual property, but it's what you create that's brand new, which is called the foreground intellectual property that usually is what you want as an industry partner. That's what has the economic benefits. That's the new product that you might patent. Um, yes, there are financial risks involved in this, but you know, that, that's, why you're, that's why you're doing a project together. So just remember that there's a lot to talk about about intellectual property when you're going into a project with a third party or a second party. When you are negotiating a project and you have to take into consideration intellectual property, remember that you know, your reputation and the time it takes to negotiate are critical. Nobody wants to, you know, to argue or to negotiate forever. So really try and listen to your partner's needs, especially when it comes to things like quality, cost, and schedule. Um, and, and understand why you're doing the project. You know? And do you really need the intellectual property that you hope to create together? Or is it just a, a slight possibility? So try and focus on the real problem you're trying to solve and how each of you can add value as partners in this project. And then the other thing I would say is just know your partner before you commit to working together, you know, whether, you know, it, a lot of relationships in business are like a marriage and, you know, don't get involved with, with people and companies that you don't trust and that you don't think you work together well. Uh, because really the goal here is to, is to share the intellectual property in such a way that you both benefit. And really think about it long-term because this project might just be a stepping, tone, stepping stone to a much bigger project in the future. All right, so trust is key. Um, it's hard to build anything if you're starting with friction. And you know, remember that you know, a lot of people fall in love with the technology, but really uh, success happens because of the people, not the technology. So focus on the people and support that. And hopefully the technology and the results will all fall in place. Okay, we are done for today. If you're in a project, or you're hoping to do some research, or you're working with other parties, and you hope to be coming up with some new, great, fascinating inventions, some new intellectual property. When that project's done, did you create anything? Go back and think carefully, because now that's the time when you want to make sure you start protecting it. 
is it worth protecting it or it, does it not have not, not meet your commercial needs and how might you protect it you know a patent a trademark copyright or trade secret quite often it is a trade secret so that is the end of the of the introduction to intellectual property 101 um, here are some additional resources that you can jump into if you're interested and you want to dig a little deeper. And if you're ever working with the University of Guelph and you want to understand intellectual property, then please give me a call anytime you want. If you are um, you know, a startup company and you're needing advice on this, talk to your business center or talk to um, Innovation Guelph. They both have access to intellectual property experts that can help you as well. And that's it. Let's, let's get into some questions if we have any. Yeah, we uh, have one question in the chat um, asking, are the people who review the patent industry experts? You mean the people, I'm assuming you mean the people at like the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Those are the patent examiners. Yes, they are experts. And so they will be experts in specific area and they are experts in patent law. So they, first they understand the rules of the country and next they understand the scientific area. Just as an example, Albert Einstein was a patent examiner. He did that for a while before he was famous as a scientist just to make some money. Do you have any tips on writing or getting uh, an NDA contract, which is a non-disclosure agreement? Um, so there are lots of templates out there for non-disclosure agreements. If you go in the public domain, and uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't, I can't tell you, uh, you know, specifically what you should or shouldn't use. I do that on behalf of the university, but that's part of my job. When it comes to personal advice, you either need to have your own lawyer or have free legal advice uh, through whoever's giving you that. But there are lots of examples of confidentiality agreements uh, or called a non-disclosure agreement in the public domain from places like Innovation Guelph or Mars or um, you know, free legal depositories where you, could, where you can get a copy of typical confidentiality agreements. You can even get a copy of the confidentiality agreements that the university uses when the university as a corporation um, does an NDA with a company, a corporation. We don't do NDAs between individuals, we do them between corporations. And then you can see the legal terms that are, that are used there. Um, there's many standard agreements that are available in general. Uh, the principles of a confidentiality agreement are, I will tell you some information, preferably I will write it down, and everything that I tell you is confidential, and everything that I mark as confidential, you shall keep secret for five years. And that's enough time for me and you to then work out whether we're going to work together or not. Okay? And if you don't do that, I can take you to court for breach of contract. Um, there's one more question in the chat of if I find that a phrase I'm using as part of my branding for a coaching business, if the title of a book is a title of a book that already exists, what are my responsibilities if I want to continue using that phrase? Okay, so the devil is in the details. It sounds like you're probably not going to be able to use that title if you're using it in any way that is associating it with the value of that book and if you know if it's like you know the seven you know the seven tips for successful people and that's a book and you're using that as part of your coaching then you're actually using some of the reputation and the expression of that book and trying to get some of that benefit for you so you have to be very careful the other thing you can do is also you know go and check and see if that name or that phrase is trademarked, although usually it's just a word, not a phrase. Um, and, you know, go and, and talk to them. The other thing you can do in a worst case scenario is um, write to the publisher or the owner of the copyright of that book and say, hey, I'm doing this and I would like to do this. I would like your permission to do so. And they may say, oh, yeah, that's not our space and that's fine. We don't care. 
more than likely are going to say, hey, if you're at all close to us, if you want to use it, you have to pay for it. So be very careful on that. Perfect. They said thank you. And then I have also uh, another question of, I have repurposed some 3,000-year-old irrigation technology so that it can be used in residential gardens. Uh, the item is made out of virtually the same ceramic, but it's a different shape and is a different kind of application. Is this intellectual property? Is it original at all? Or is it simply something old modernized? Very good question. Again, devil's in the details. It's probably something that's just being modernized. It's probably not something that's patentable. It is intellectual property because it's your ideas. You've come up with an improvement. Could you get a patent approved for it? It depends. It depends how different it is and how obvious it is, your improvements to it. Um, so it doesn't mean you can't use it, but it just might mean that you cannot patent it. Now, if you, you know, if you have done this, if you found out that 3,000 years ago this was used, well, then that's in the public domain. So it's not novel. But you may have done things in a very different way because you said it's a different kind of application. That application might be different enough that it's not obvious what you've done, and therefore you may be able to do it. It wasn't used in the same manner. So it, it potentially could be patented. Okay. <laughs> 